part of my interest in jazz is educating people about jazz, not just the students I have, but the audiences and even, believe it or not, the people, my colleagues in the music department about what jazz actually is. And for people in the university community uh, at large. So this is a really beautiful opportunity. There are three types of audiences for jazz, and we have a lot of people that fit, fit into these three types. The first type of audience for jazz is the knowledgeable jazz musician who goes to hear somebody play because they're inspired by them. Like Joe and I and my students would go and see, um, went and see Chris Potter and Pat Metheny a, a few months ago at the Libero Theater. I'm sitting there like listening to what they're doing, looking at the interaction, hearing how the pieces are, are put together. Other people are listening in different ways. So another type of audience would be a musician who maybe doesn't really understand jazz, but appreciates that somebody can play. And the third type of audience, somebody who doesn't play music, but likes jazz. So there, there's a lot of different, there's a lot of play there for creating a problem or creating a misunderstanding. Types of performers, true, true artists who's just doing it to make art. There's a lot of people like that. And then there's people who are trying to make money. As, and that's, to me, that's more pop music. That's more art music versus pop music. And those get mixed up quite a lot. How many people, you know, this is a terrible, I'm, I'm sorry to make this uh, example, but, you know, a lot of, I, I, people will say to me, oh, I love jazz. Oh, yeah? Who do you listen to? Oh, I love Kenny G. <laughs> you know, I get that a lot. <laughs> and there's nothing, you know, Kenny G, there's nothing wrong with him. But he made a lot of money, he makes a lot of money playing the music that he plays. And I'm not sure that that's his real, his real purpose in life is to play music to be an artist. Because he really likes to play golf. He's a really good golfer. He has a lot of money and he has a lot of free time. So, um, <laughs> so and, but if you, you know, there's a lot of guys out there like, okay, Chris Barton's making a lot of money now. But he, there was a time where he didn't make a lot of money. And he still was banging away at it for a long time. And he's the kind of guy that a friend of mine went to school with him in New York. And he said that him and Chris Potter would show up at the music building at 6 a.m. every day. And Chris Potter would practice for eight hours before he had something else to do. If you haven't heard Chris Potter play, he's amazing. Incredible. <laughs> so then the perception of music, and jazz music specifically, as in the, in the whole sphere of art and culture, as is it art? Is it art or is it pop music? Is it art music or is it pop music? I've had a lot of people, including my colleagues at UCSB, refer to jazz as pop music, <coughs> and I, I vehemently deny that because it's just just because the, the the misunderstanding comes from the fact that a lot of the repertoire that you hear jazz being played on is pop music. Was pop music from the 30s and 40s? Or even earlier, the 20s. So, just the fact that there's a, a popular music being used as the basis for the performance of the music doesn't mean that it's pop music. So there's a, a real, a real misunderstanding there. And then the whole idea of pop music and versus art music and the infusion of world music, like you, like you um, mentioned with African music and Latin music. There's a, a lot of confusion about what jazz is. You start to hear you know, the Buena Vista Social Club, or you hear some blues artists, you hear some of this, it kind of all gets lumped into the same jazz category. And you don't, it's, it's very hard to sort it out at times, isn't it? Um, I have a, a question. I, I remember this rhythm and blues was a big thing. And yeah, well, that's definitely Jazz in the 50s, and there was a musician, actually, who grew up here in Santa Barbara, who performed in San Francisco, I think he did the album Take Five. Yeah, well that's Dave Brubeck. Dave Brubeck, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he was a jazz musician. Yeah, he was a jazz musician. But he came out of a classical, more of a classical background. Right, he kind of, <coughs> right. created a kind of new thing. Kind of a new thing, yeah, but it's more, it's, it has a classical air to it, but it's definitely jazz. And, and jazz has always been a fusion, which I'll get to, a fusion of different styles and ideas, <coughs> which is further confusing, I think, to people. Hear all the all these different things going on, but it all gets lumped into the jazz category a lot of times, and it's very I think it's very confusing. Further, furthermore, you know, recordings, hearing a recording 
versus seeing a live performance is very is very different because in jazz in a lot of pop music pop music the audience goes to that in even in classical music too classical music and pop music audience goes to see a performance expecting a certain thing to happen if you go to see Santa Barbara Symphony play Beethoven Seven you know what you're getting. You know exactly what you're going to hear, as long as you know that piece really well. You know exactly every note that you're going to hear, you've heard before. Same thing with a, a performance by Katy Perry at the Carnegie Bowl. Mm -hmm. You're going to hear the, the tune exactly like it's on the record, right? With jazz, that does not happen. <laughs> and that is very, so let's say you go to see Dave Brubeck. Oh man, he's gonna play take five, and they play take five, and it sounds nothing like. <laughs> this happened actually specifically happened a number of years ago when Herbie Hancock and Wayne Shorter played a duo concert at the Libero. They played so freely that most of the tunes they played, I had trouble recognizing. <laughs> challenging people to listen to music in a different way. And artists are challenging people, challenging their perception of music, and challenging what, what you think of as music, <coughs> or think of as good music. And then further, now this is within jazz musicians themselves, there's a war between <coughs> progressive music and traditional or classical music. Right? Mm -hmm. Now to me, jazz by definition has to be progressive. As soon as it becomes a classical music, it's not jazz anymore. Jazz is a music that exists in the moment and furthering on and constantly evolving, constantly developing. As soon as it becomes something specific, like we're doing a concert at Ellington stuff <coughs> next week, uh, uh, next Wednesday, please feel free to come grab a... That's what this whole thing Where is about, it? actually. <laughs> it's an advertisement for our jazz concert. I'm sorry. To Where? It's at UCSB. There's a flyer. There's flyers back there. But we're doing all um, Ellington music, which is great for teaching people how to play and great to play. It's beautiful music. But is it jazz? It's jazz style. It's, in jazz, it's music in the style of jazz. But is it jazz by a definition of creating something new? and challenging people's ears, and doing something exciting and, and progressive. Because a lot of times when you hear something progressive, does anybody listen to bar talk or really, you know, something really dissonant, you know, uh, Henrecki or some, some 20th century, Ligeti, 20th century composers who are very challenging to people's ears. It's very hard to listen to for a lot of people, it's, but it's progressive music. It's moving the, the music forward. It's, music, it's moving the art form forward. Jazz musicians are doing the same thing. So to me, this is a huge problem with jazz, is the understanding of what's going on, the process, and also the context in which jazz exists and works as an art form or as a popular music form, which I don't think it does. Is there, are there any questions about that? Yes. Um, well, in my lifetime, it, we had the ballrooms, right? And the big bands, right? And I'll get to that. That actually. that sort of disappeared, and and so we wound up with a small group. Well, there's two reasons why that happened, and I was going to talk about that in a second. So, but thank you for reminding me. That's <coughs> yes. Um, what about classical jazz? And from the way that you seem to be talking about it, it seemed to be that that was maybe almost an oxymoron. It is an oxymoron. Did you? Okay. Did you have a specific um, artist in mind, or? No. Well, I don't well, know that much about well, it. Well, I'll say this. There's a, there's a saxophonist named Sonny Rollins. Has anybody ever heard of him? Yeah. yeah. Sonny Rollins is a quintessential jazz artist. For his whole life, he's constantly practicing, constantly trying to get better, constantly performing. His recordings, he doesn't like his recordings. I don't think he even listens to his recordings mm -hmm. because he doesn't consider them to be a representation of what he's doing because he's already done it. It's over. <laughs> as soon as he plays something, he, it's gone and that's it. It shouldn't even be listened to again in his imagination. And that's what it's about. That's, mm -hmm. that's what that idea is about. That it shouldn't exist as a performance in its own right and something a piece set. in its own right, uh -huh. but it's constant it's constantly evolving and becoming something else. Being creative. Being creative. Yeah. There's a question over here. Yes. Um, you mentioned that there's a lot of 
I, I quite see your point in saying that jazz, like Indian music that plays on yeah. rockers, is Very constantly right. creative and improvisational. Yeah. And now, um, when you said that if you go to hear a Beethoven's Seventh Symphony or whatever, you, you know exactly what to expect. Well, that, the yes, I, I understand exactly what you're going to say. Or if you hear a cello piece which you heard by Casals and you hear it today right. by Yo Yo Ma, yes, there are, be there are very, but there are very subtle I, I, I differences. Noticed, I know it's yes. within certain boundaries. Yes. But then are there any boundaries in jazz beyond which you would say this is not jazz? Improvisational boundaries. Yes, there are. And I was going that that that's based on the traditions, much like in Indian music. And there are people that are constantly pushing against that tradition. And just like in Indian music, there are people who are staunch traditionalists and, and people yeah. who are progressive, trying to be progressive, either mm -hmm. by bringing other influences yeah. into the music or changing the traditions in a way, in a certain way, right? So you, you, North Indian classical music has the same <laughs> kind of problem where you have people that are constantly warring against one another. And, and I agree with you about the Beethoven 7 comment. But it's sort of a, uh, a question of percentage. You know, 97% of every Beethoven 7 performance is going to be the same. There's 3% that is different. Wouldn't you? It's very, it's very yeah. subtle. But if you have to ask, you'll never know. Right. <laughs> that, uh, that was actually something that I forgot to do, was to kind of ask people, what is jazz? Yeah. What is your perception of jazz? And if it's going to change from the beginning of this to the end of this, which is something I'm always interested in. Yes? But after your talk, we won't ask. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, after, after my talk, I hope you ask even more. <laughs> yeah, more questions about that. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, basically, what she's saying, I hear something, and uh, I can distinguish jazz. Jazz, to me, is always... Um, uh, it involves a trombone. Well, we'll talk. We'll talk about that in one second. But I was also going to say a lot of artists, like you mentioned, Dave Brubeck. I remember uh, I adore him. He used to play in Manhattan Beach. Right. Uh, that little club there. The lighthouse. The lighthouse. The lighthouse. Oh, yeah. that was there right. every day. Oh, yeah. and, but I always knew him as a classical guitarist. Dave Brubeck. Dave Brubeck as a classical. He didn't play guitar. No. Who am I thinking of? Mm -hmm. there also. A lot of people play there. <laughs> yeah, right. A lot of people play there. But I don't know what they would make it. A couple more questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, how important tonality is to be in this distinction? How important is tonality? Yeah. Like, Very important, but I'll talk about that in a second. Do <laughs> you think that's more, is jazz more tonal? than that? Is that. jazz tonal? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Very much so. Most kinds of jazz, especially the the jazz that uses the top the pop repertoire, like the Tim Pan Alley, the tunes like "Sorry with a Friend on Top." And like com they comparing with some contemporary serious music in the classical world, like Alias Flores music. That's a whole other thing. It uses, but jazz, jazz jazz crosses that entire spectrum. Mm -hmm. It can be very inside what we call what we as jazz musicians call inside, which means diatonic in the key that you're playing, or it can be outside, pushing the bounds of chromaticism and tonality. And you'll hear Matt do plenty of that, because sometimes he doesn't really hit the tune. <laughs> <laughs> I like to joke with my hands. Yes, we have a question back there. But at the Lighthouse, uh, uh, Howard Rumsey was the yep. guy there, and he played the bass, and it, it always looked like he was caressing a woman. Like, yeah. I'll tell his wife that you just said that. <laughs> She's still booking the music down there. That's right. uh, just, I'm just thinking of from what you're saying from the standpoint of teaching and learning. Uh, how how would someone how would someone learn jazz? Wouldn't you to put it a little differently? It would seem to make it a statement. It would seem that if you're interested in jazz and you're in, as a musician or want to be interested in jazz, wouldn't it be helpful to look back and find yes. people who seem to be exemplary in yes. some sense? Yes. And therefore, there has to be a sense in which you are referring back to classic quote classical jazz musicians, so that you can learn, assimilate, and then be creative after that. <laughs> this is coming. 
Okay. Right. <laughs> no, 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 no question. Yeah. Because, because I've taken all this stuff into account, trust me. Uh, there, yes, yes. In order to look forward, you have to look back. Okay. But that doesn't mean you can live in the past and play that, play those solos or play exactly like that. There are people that do that. When Marcellus is one of the real guys that does that, that doesn't think that anything that happened past 1940 is great music, but he's still doing it. He's still doing it. So. Perhaps we could hold the question for sure. 15, 20 minutes while sure. you do your thing. Please. Okay, so the discussion of jazz style. So every performance is unique. This is, a, I think, a huge thing about jazz performance, a real jazz performance, that every performance of, of, of music is unique, even of the same music. So if we play Autumn Leaves like, like we will later, if we played it once and then five minutes, five minutes went by and we played it again, it would be very different in many different ways. Not consciously. We wouldn't consciously do it different. It's just how it is. Band consisting of a rhythm section that provides rhythm and harmony, and horns that provide melody. Horns being trombone, trumpet, saxophone. Generally, those are the main ones. And this is uh, primarily, I'm talking about small group performance, like we're going to do. Big band performance is a completely different animal. Rhythms, the rhythm of jazz is based on quarter note pulses, like when the drummer is going ding, 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 the bass player is going boom, 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 walking bass. That's a quarter, that's a quarter note pulse. And eighth note motor rhythm. Swung or straight. Swung is the second one. Straight is da 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 The harmony <laughs> it's based on, I'm pointing out a little people yeah. that ask these questions. Harmony is based on Western European tonality, or modern modality, which is, um, you know, kind of post-1950, extending, extending uh, harmonic, more extended harmonic stuff, more atonality, less to do with playing in a specific key, but mixing keys, and mixing modes. Now, I will, I will say that this harmony based on Western European tonality, it was highly influenced by African music, by the, the minor pentatonic scale that came from Africa with the slaves that ended up in Cuba and Florida and New Orleans, where jazz was born. That, that, that created the blues scale, the bluesy sound, that eventually became associated with jazz. But jazz is primarily very, very, very diatonic very much tonal music, very much tonal music. The melody is derived, is, is very closely associated with the harmony of any tune. So the, the melody has to fit the harmony. Chamber music style performance meaning there's not a conductor. And uh, the repertoire generally consists of either Broadway style music, which is like, starting with Friends on Top, like I mentioned before, what are some other Broadway style tunes that you've heard as jazz tunes? Bye Bye Blackbird, anybody else? <laughs> what? We Small Hours of the Morning. We Small Hours of the Morning. Good one. Anybody else? Most of the stuff from Oklahoma, South Pacific. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah. All that stuff gets used for as jazz, <clears throat> but it's not like, they don't perform it like it is in the music. <laughs> or original compositions by jazz musicians, such as Dave Blue writing Take uh, take Five, or Blue Ronde on the Turf, or, or Wayne Shorter writing Juju, or any of the great compositions he wrote. Um, or the, all the tunes that we're going to play later are all by jazz musicians. So you'll see that it's a, it's a different animal in a way. Well, we're going to do a performance of a standard, <coughs> of a Broadway style standard, we're going to play Autumn Leaves. It's actually more, that's more of a burlesque song from France. But, that's all. What about the atonal style of classical, like somber? What about it? Is it jazz? It, it shows up in jazz, sure. Cecil, Cecil Taylor. Do I think Cecil Taylor? Yeah. Cecil Taylor played very atonally. Coltrane played extraordinarily atonally right. at the end of his career. Like, it was very free, very avant garde, and again, we'll talk about that. Any other quick questions? Quick, one, one quick question. Okay. 
So jazz tradition and history. So the genesis of jazz is what I alluded to a, a, a moment ago regarding how, keep an eye on the time because I tend to talk a lot as my students will tell you. Um, keeping the, the jazz became what it is because there was a confluence of, of music and influences in New Orleans. So prior to jazz developing, and really the first jazz people were Jelly Roll Morton, who was a pianist, composer, and Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Before that, there was a number of things going on. There was blues, there was uh, you know, country blues, with, with classical country blues, and then they, that got mixed with spirituals that the slaves were singing, or they weren't slaves anymore, but they were free slaves. And um, brass band music, there was a, a guy named uh, James Reese Europe, I think is his name. I'm trying to remember, it was a long time ago that I took these jazz, jazz history classes. James Reese Europe had these like enormous brass band in, in New Orleans that eventually became, that, actually, that music that became Scott Joplin's piano music. Scott Joplin based his piano music on James Reese Europe's marches. They were all marches. But nobody knows what it sounded like. Because there was never any recording of it. And um, that was in the late 1800s that that was happening. Louis Armstrong definitely would have heard that and would have been influenced by that. Yes? But was that part of the funeral marches? Yes, it's kind of, that, that grew out of James Bruce Europe. You know, yes. So there was the, all those influences coming together, plus Western European harmony getting mixed in, and the blues scale, not the blues scale, but the pentatonic sound and scale that you heard a lot in spirituals. And that all came together to create jazz. So that's what happened in the very early part of jazz, previous to 1920 or so. So then we have, from 1920 on, things are kind of moving around, things are progressing. First thing that happens is you have bands kind of go together, you have like the original Dixieland Jazz Band and Louis, Louis, Louis Armstrong's group, the Hot Five and the Hot Seven, and um, what we what we now call Dixieland Jazz, that moved up to Chicago and became you know, traditional jazz. If you hear that now, people usually call it trad jazz. Like in Sacramento, they have a trad jazz festival. That's all Dixieland, but it's based on that early Louis Armstrong kind of stuff. Then bands kind of got together and started to form bigger groups. And this is where Ellington's band started in 1920 something in, in Washington. His first band was fairly small, uh, about seven people, six or seven people. And it was based, again, it was based on the instrumentation of that Louis Armstrong band. From there, we developed the big bands, the bigger groups of, of instruments five saxes, three trombones, three trumpets. You have the classic big band sound that, that um, Don Redman was a, a arranger and uh, Benny Goodman bought all his arrangements. Uh, and Fletcher Harrison. Fletcher Harrison and Don Redman. Where they, they wrote a lot of stuff and Benny Goodman bought all that stuff. That became his band. So the classic swing band stuff in the mood, all that kind of stuff. It's a big band. That lasted until about 1940. And the reason why after 1940 is when the small group really developed. And this is what we call modern jazz. It's kind, of, it's kind of a nasty thing to say, but that's what we consider modern jazz. Bebop, Charlie Parker, Dizzy Gillespie. When people talk about jazz, that's where they start talking about jazz. Big bands is really, we almost consider big band to be pop music. We do consider big band to be pop music because so much of it was just played for swing dancing. That's, that's just the, the truth. And remember that previous thing where I, I said that the, um, every performance was a unique performance? That doesn't really hold true in that case. Those big band performances, by and large, play those tune, the tunes exactly the same way every night. Sometimes down to the solos that, that the guys play. They play the exact same solo night after night. Is that jazz after a while? I'm not sure. That's, was a kind of a gray area. So the big bands were, to me, commercial music, not so much art music. 
That doesn't mean to say that you can't have a big band that's very artistic and very jazz. Ellington's band never stopped being jazz. Count Basie's band never stopped being jazz. So, but they made a lot of money going around playing those dances. <laughs> Ellington's band lasted for 50 years playing those dances, playing at those dance halls. They, they, sure, the music was definitely a step above you know, when some of these other bands from the Midwest White bands from the <laughs> Midwest would come in. Ellington's band played completely differently. But they played for dancers primarily. They played for dancers. So um, the main style period. So we have Bebop after 1940 or so. And then there's a reaction to Bebop called Cool, which is because Bebop was kind of angular and jagged and people people didn't really couldn't really deal with it. So then they had this cool thing that Chet Baker and Jerry Mulligan were kind of the the, um, and again, it was sort of, it almost became like a white thing. <laughs> Bebop was a black thing, cool was a white thing, but Miles Davis did it all, so I don't know if that's just about Miles Davis. Um, and, then at, and then there was another reaction to cool called Hard Bop, which is sort of the second coming of Bebop. And it was a little bit different, but Sonny Rollins was, was one of those, one of the Hard Boppers, um, Clifford Brown, different, different names I could draw. Um, and then uh, after Hard Bop happened, it pretty much became more of a modern style in the 60s, avant-garde, John Coltrane. All I have to say is John Coltrane happened in the 60s, and, mm -hmm. and that like, kind of changed everything, freed everything up. And you, you, jazz is really a reflection of society also. That's the thing that makes it an art music for sure. Because think about art. You know, they, artists didn't write the same way, didn't, didn't paint the same way, poets didn't write the same way all the time. They are always being affected by what's happening in the world. In the 30s, it was a very stable. It was a very stable society in the United States. People went to dances. What happened in the 40s? War. That changed the way art was, was being given up. And this is, this is what happened because of Bebop happened because there was a lot of chaos happening. After that, it became a little more settled again, and things kind of settled down. But the 60s were a very turbulent time, and the music, the jazz music reflected that. So listen to some late Coltrane, and you'll be like, oh, wow, what's going on here? You know, but it really reflected what was happening in the world at that time. And then in the 70s, really nothing happened in jazz. <laughs> no, actually, what happened in, in the 70s was there was, uh, it kind of, became, it actually became very commercial in the 70s. People realized they could make money off of jazz. There was this record label called Concord. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, Concord, Concord Jazz was a, um, was, was a label that was kind of dead set on making money. Some great singers on Concord. And case in point, they were trying to make money. They were, it was very commercial. Great jazz not, not, that, not that it wasn't great jazz singers. Great jazz singers. On absolutely, Concord. absolutely. But the intent of that record label was to make money. More so than anything else. And a lot of the artists that were on there were making were intent on making money. It's just I'm I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It's I'm saying that people realize they can make money on jazz. And so, this, so in, in some ways, it kind of dulled down the artistic spirit and the progressive spirit of jazz. Because suddenly, you know, once somebody makes money doing something, everybody jumps on that bandwagon. And that's not, that's not progressive music, I don't think. That's everybody doing the same thing, trying to make money. You got a question? Yes. Where do you put, I think it's back to the 50s and maybe earlier, Benny Carter. Benny Carter is a hard bop guy. Hard bop. Yeah, really. He says that's a funny anachronistic or doesn't feel like it fits. He's yeah. so smooth. I yeah, I did, well, Harbop is smoother than Bebop, though. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of Dexter Gordon's Harbop. I mean, he's kind of smooth, right? Hank Mobley's kind of smooth. He's Harbop. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real wide designation. When did Carter first become popular? In the 40s or in the 50s? I, I'd say the 50s. 50s, 50s yeah. More so in the 50s. I'm not, he's not an artist I'm really super familiar with, so I, I might be completely wrong. This is not something I really deal with that much. 
So then in the 80s, there was a lot of world music infusion into the music. There was a lot of Latin stuff. Like I, I went to school in the 80s, and there, I just remember, like, Dizzy Gillespie came to town, and he had this Latin band, and it was a lot of Latin stuff going on, a lot of Latin music infused into jazz, even though Dizzy Gillespie did that in the 50s, in the 40s and 50s, too. Um, so, and then in the 90s, it's just really been a mixture of stuff. 90s and 2000s have been a mixture of stuff. On evolving. One interesting thing about that record, that, that Three Quartets record, which was recorded in 1978, I believe. It yeah, published in 81. 81? Okay, probably recorded in 1980. He, Chick Corea cites a lot of influences, most of whom are classical. Hmm. He cites Bartok, Luslowski, hmm. uh, Berio, I, I can't remember all the people that he cites as influences, but they were mostly classical. But there are tunes that are dedicated to John Coltrane and to Gellington. So, <coughs> so uh, one thing somebody was talking about vocal, like Louis Armstrong is important because he was both a vocalist and a player. And he constantly played trumpet like he was singing, and he sang like he was playing trumpet. <laughs> and I think that's like a really big thing for vocalists to try to sound like instrumentalists. Um, Ella Fitzgerald was was really well known for that. She was such an incredible mimic. Uh, Sarah Vaughan. Sarah Vaughan, I, con I consider to be more of a musician, more of a more of an instrumentalist than a singer, actually. Because she played piano really great, and she was a great musician all around. So there is this whole vocal tradition versus instrumental tradition. And I think that they're both very valid, and they both feed off one another. In the best, in the best world, they, they feed off one another. I mentioned this before, the recorded tradition versus the live tradition. And this is how, uh, he asked it back there, you know, how do people learn how to play jazz? If you're trying to be progressive, you've got to look back. And this is, the wonderful thing about jazz is that it's mostly recorded. It's, the history is laid out for us. You know, Mozart, we don't have recordings of Mozart playing, we don't have recordings of Beethoven playing. It would be awesome if we did, because it would completely change the way we play their music. Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, and that's, what, and that's what musicologists do. And that's what these ancient music ensembles try to do. They try to, but they're, they're deducing what it sounded like. They're deducing how that music was performed. We don't have to deduce. We know exactly how it was performed because it was recorded. And that's the wonderful thing about recordings. Does that mean that if we listen to a recording of um, Miles Davis's All the Autumn Leaves, that we should play it that way every single time? No. Because that's no longer jazz. That's if, if I if I had if I had us come up and play that tune just like Miles Davis did, I would not consider that jazz. Would I consider that a good teaching tool? Yes. You have to you have to start there. You have to do that. But that doesn't mean you should play it. So that's this is what I, sort of what I'm gauging now: the teaching of jazz, the the oral tradition, which is sort of an older way of doing it. I remember somebody telling me about. In the 40s in New York, Dizzy Gillespie used to, on breaks, he used to go up to the roof of wherever the club they were playing at, and he used to like teach people how to play, teach people what was going on. He'd play piano, there was like an old piano somewhere, and he would like, he would like orally teach and play, and that's how the music was learned over more than anything else. Now we have academic, it's all academic traditions. You have either private teachers, one on one, teaching students how to play. Or you're at a school where there's a lot of students and a few faculty, and you're learning how to play. That doesn't mean that you're not learning other ways. You're still listening to recordings. You're still listening to people, going to see people play live. That's more like the, the old oral tradition of learning. If I go to see, I'm a drummer, if I go to see Pat Metheny's group with uh, Antonio Sanchez playing, I'm learning as I'm listening to him play. That's, that's me listening, oral tradition, or talking, or oral listening, oral. Yes. Speaking of percussion, uh, do you know if there's any teaching of percussion in the African fashion, which is the drummer stands behind the student and taps the rhythm on his back? Yeah, that that, but that the African tradition is master drummer, master teacher, and students, and that's they they just play. He gives them the pattern to play, and they play. And they don't they don't do anything else until he says, okay, now you can do something else. Until he's satisfied that they can do something else. 
I'm talking sure. about the technique of tapping on the back. Sure, I, I'm sure that I'm sure that happens. I do that to my students. Okay, just wondering. Yeah, absolutely. <coughs> And then, then there's a whole thing of etiquette and respect in, in jazz performances or in jams. Like, the big thing about jazz in the 40s and 50s was jam sessions. People would go to jam sessions to learn, to, to, to meet each other. And that still happens today, that you go to a jam session. And there's a whole etiquette and respect thing going on that you have to follow. You have to talk to the right people. You have to play. You have to... You, you don't want to go to a jam session and take 15 choruses on something because people will start like looking at you, <laughs> you know, play for 15 minutes on a tune and you're, you're, they're just like, okay, come on, come on, because other people want to play. So there's, there's a whole lot of etiquette and respect that nobody ever really talks about, but you kind of learn it over time. Am I wrong about that? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. But there's, there's probably somebody should probably publish a book about that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. How do you teach jazz? My impression of jazz is that it's very technical. Yeah. Very I'm getting there. <laughs> I'm nice ahead of you, aren't I? <laughs> so she asked, actually asked a really good question. You know, how do you teach to play jazz? Well, the, the way you teach to play jazz is to teach somebody the process of playing jazz. What's the process? So we're going to perform a tune called Setting Moon for Two right now. Right now, we're going to perform a tune called Setting Moon for Two. I didn't say it twice. <laughs> You ask, you know, how do you teach, how do you learn and how do you teach jazz? So, first of all, we have, we play off of something called lead sheets, which is a melody and changes, right there. I'm going to put up the one for, for Sunny Moon for Two in a second. Sunny Moon for Two is a blues. Now, what makes something a blues? Generally, a blues is 12 bars long, which is a weird kind of form. It's an old form. And there's, some, there's like classical blues that you think of like Robert Johnson or B.B. King play. And those guys all play 12 bar, mainly they play 12 bar blues. And um, it's a very old form, but jazz players play it a little differently than the blues players play it. But the main, the main thing is that it's, kind of, it's, a, it's a certain chord quality. Can you play like a dominant chord? A dominant chord is a very tonal sound because I don't want to get too technical here because start losing people. But can you play five one like the, like D flat to E flat major, D flat seven. Oh yeah. Um, yeah so. No, no, it's an E flat, E flat major, two major. They, they have like an actual moment. Like a five one, <laughs> a regular five one. Time. They're not both dominant. Dominant to major. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now that, this, this is what this is what Western music is based on. Five one, five one, five one, five one. Dominant tonic. Beautifully. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it took a second try. So. Western music is based on that, and if you look, if you really look at jazz, like especially the, the Broadway musical repertoire, you'll see five one, five one, five one, all over the place. It might be in different keys, but that's what you'll see. And blues doesn't have that. It kind of does, and it kind of doesn't. So, but blues is a twelve bar. Blues is a twelve bar form that starts in a key. And then it goes to the four, and then it goes back to the one, and then it goes to five, four, one. Can we play a blues that's just really simple? Five, four, one. Five, four, one. So one, four, one. Yeah. Five, four, one. Yeah. Four, one. Oh, what? Yeah. Yeah. Where'd that come from? I brought it. <laughs> 
Yeah, let's do it. Uh, actually, sending one for two is in B class, so let's do it. Okay, good. <laughs> one, two, Charlie Parker Blues wouldn't do this, but it, even though Sonny Rollins came after, after, after Charlie Parker. But this is kind of a blues scale as a solo, as a, as a melodic. It's blues scale. So this is a blues. One, four, one, four, one, two, five, one. So it's very, it's very, I was just referencing chords. It doesn't matter that you understand that. 12 bars long. The first shift is from one, one chord to the four chord. That's what makes it a blues, basically. So let me go back, because I don't, I don't want to say anything that I might have wanted to say previous. So how do we play over this? Well, first of all, we play the melody like we just did. And generally, blues, because it's only 12 bars long, we play it twice. Most regular, most uh, song forms was 32 bars long, four eight bar phrases. So this, as a blues, is only 12 bars. We usually play it twice, because otherwise it's done too fast. And then we solo. And how do we solo? We solo over the same changes. We just use the chord changes, but the form stays the same. We're playing, tw we're playing groups of 12 bars over and over again. We're just not playing the melody. We might reference the melody. You might use the melody as part of your solo, but we don't, we don't play the, the melody verbatim again, until the very end when we play the melody out, and we call it the head out. The melody is all, all usually called the head. If, we're, we're, if I say, hey, let's play the melody, they'll go, what? <laughs> we say, oh, let's play the head. Head out. You like this. Head out. <laughs> Time to play out. Okay. So one thing, uh, player responsibilities. So every, every one of these instruments, except for me, of course, has a responsibility. <laughs> Matt's responsibility is to play the melody correctly, in tune, with a good sound, in time, okay, um, and then to solo, and then to stand around looking cool. <laughs> Saxophone's cool. Miller's, Miller's job is to play quarter note time and to accurately represent the, harmon the harmonic motion with the bass lines that he's making. Now, he's improvising a bass line as he plays. Doesn't mean he's never played the way he's playing before, but he's improvising the bass line. And then, at some point, he'll solo also. But, what, but another one of his big responsibilities is to play good time, more so than Matt. That doesn't mean that Matt, that doesn't, mean that Matt doesn't have to play good time, but he's less responsible for it. Dan's responsibility is to play the changes, play the harmonic structure of the tune so that it's audible for us to play over, so that we all stay together. Now, it's very, it's very common that, especially students, they lose track of where they are in the changes and get lost and don't accurately represent 12 bars. They can even get lost in 12 bars. And every tune's a little different, has its own unique challenges. This one is actually very simple. Uh, he's, he will also solo at some point, and he also has to play good time. So he, so if there's three, three um, parts to music, rhythm, harmony, and melody, each of us has different, different uh, levels of responsibility for each of those three. The guy that has the most responsibility for all three is Guess. 
Never. No. Never really does mostly rhythm. Not so much, not so, doesn't do harmony audibly. You won't hear the drummer playing audibly harmony. You won't hear him play melody unless he's incredibly melodic like I am. Uh, <laughs> so, which one of us, which one of these guys has the most responsibility for all three of those rhythm, harmony, and melody? Yes. Piano. Piano. Somebody says piano. Why do you think piano? I just think that it holds the whole thing together. Well, he's mainly doing harmony. He doesn't play melody that much until he's solo. Well, how about the wait, 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 I want to finish this one. <laughs> and, and, and rhythmically, he's, he's just like kind of hitting things here and there, kind of, comp he's comping, accompanying. Comping, we call it, we say comping. He's accompanying, or complimenting. That's the other way that we say it. So he's mainly doing harmony. Good job. We don't have any bass. The bass. We'll come back to him. <laughs> so what is Matt just mostly doing? Melody. Matt's mostly doing melody, so his responsibility is mostly melodic. The bass does all three, because his, his, his lines have to be melodic, but they also have to represent the harmonic structure, and he's keeping time. I often make my, um, make my bass players feel good about themselves, because they, they generally are very insecure guys. Um, <laughs> I, I make them feel better about themselves by telling them that they're the most important person in the band, which is absolutely true. If you really do not... <laughs> they are the most important. To me, the, the bass... If you have a good bass player, you have a shot at having a good band. If you have a bad bass player, you're in trouble. It doesn't, if you have a great bass player and the rest of the band is eh, it's, it's still going to be okay. But if you have a bad bass player and the rest of the band is great, you're in trouble. Okay. <laughs> it's very sketchy, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They're like, yeah, yeah. I mean, even if, even if the drummer's bad like I am, Miller will still make me sound good. I can almost never make a bad bass player sound bad. And I've tried. <laughs> Actually, I have two things. <laughs> okay, so, so let's, now let's play this. Let's play an actual performance of this. So I'm going to tell them what we're going to do. Twice with the head, and then uh, everybody takes two choruses, and then we'll trade fours with the drums for two choruses. So it'll, it'll be one each. And then we'll play the head twice we we'll do the same. We'll do the same order. So, sax, piano, bass. But for the four, it's the same order. Yeah. So each of you play one four. Okay. Cool. Then, yes. you guys had no idea what I was saying. <laughs> but they completely understood. It's amazing. <laughs>
Changes are going by the same speed. Everybody knows how long they're going on. How, everybody knows how long they're going by. So does he take a, a bar less? Solo? No. Well, he plays a bar less. Play more He'll play a couple bars less. less. Play yeah. a bar shorter in a solo. No. We still play the same amount. Of, we still play the same twelve bars every single time. It doesn't matter whether he starts right here or starts here or starts here or starts here. And he doesn't play a shorter time. Technically, he plays a shorter time, but it's still his solo. Whether he's playing or not, it's still his solo. Okay. And, and that's one of the choices that you make as a soloist, is how much space to leave. That there is a balance between space and, and play. And some, some soloists, some people play a lot. Some people play too much. Some people don't play a lot less. Some people use more space. Some people use less space. It's a choice. It's an artistic choice, just what we're talking about. How do you, how do you explore creativity? That's one of the ways that you explore creativity. 